Hey, good morning, folks. Thanks for showing up early. Uh, we'll be probably starting in two to three minutes. Thanks. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to be starting in two minutes, two minutes. Thanks for showing up. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can you hear me out there? Just to make sure that. Yep, I, I can hear you. Thank you. All right, well, happy Friday. Uh, welcome to our Lunch and Learn webinar, whatever you want to call it, Pollinators and Rainy Days. My name is Greg Dahl. I work in the uh, School of Medicine and the Office of Medicine and uh, Medical Education. And uh, I'm also a member of the Pollinator Habitat Advisory Committee here at Pitt uh, that runs through the Pitt Sustainability Group uh, here. And then here are some of the, um, you know, kind of our objectives is that uh, we created and advised this implementation plan for the Habitat Plan. We work very closely with Pitt Grounds, the grounds crew, um, to ensure that you know, we're kind of keeping the standards and everybody's on the same page. And we also lead the university's annual B Campus USA application um, through the Xerxes Society, which requires different things to make sure that the entire university is doing um, to help pollinators. I'm going to put in the chat here, too, if you're around the Pittsburgh area, uh, there is the Pit to Porch um, event for next week, I believe. Uh, and it was really interesting. I did it last year. Uh, there's a tour of the pollinator gardens around the main campus here in Oakland uh, that ends at the Porch Restaurant, the Porch on Shenley, uh, that has a garden on their roof and beehives on their roof. And their beekeeper will be there to answer any questions. And last year, they let us scurry up the ladder to go and take a look around there. So it was very interesting. So um, space is limited, but if that's something that interests you, uh, please sign up and we hope to see you there. 
The objectives today are to identify areas suitable for a rain garden on your property, uh, to understand the building requirements needed for a useful rain garden. We're going to talk about some native plants that would really enjoy being in your rain garden, and also talk a little bit about stormwater credits. If you pay a stormwater fee, there may be an opportunity um, to get a credit or to get a little of that money back. If you have any questions at any time, you can feel free to put them into your uh, into the chat or, you know, at, at breaks, we can ask and we can talk about them then. All right, so why a rain garden? So, you know, an idea of a rain garden as the picture, this is a more commercial one, but I love it on this side of the road here on the right, um, is to keep any precipitation that falls on your property on your property and not having it run off down the roads, down the sidewalks or anywhere else. And that, you know, is, better than how it often happens now. So number one, in southwestern Pennsylvania, um, among other places, you know, runoff after a large rain can cause flash flooding. All right. So we've seen that in the past in Route 51 in the South Hills or up, you know, um, down Nagley Run Road and things along those lines where, where all this rain comes, it's not soaking into the ground. And instead, it's flowing down the roads and causing flooding. That happens extremely quick. Um, you know, a rain garden can help slow that down in many ways because, again, we're trying to keep all the precipitation that falls on a certain area in that area without having it flow off. It also does things like keeping salt and chemicals out of the waterways. In many places, you know, the drains at the bottom of your street might go directly into a river or a creek or whatever. In my case, where I live, there's a lot that goes right into sawmill run. Um, you know, the more water that we can keep out of there keeps the road salt, keeps the chemicals, keeps the oil that's dripping out of someone's car, you know, out of those, out of those waterways. Um, and then it also becomes a wildlife habitat. So it gives an opportunity to not only have some of these benefits, um, you know, environmentally, but it also creates environments that could be really lovely to look at. Who are our pollinators? Well, of course, we love every one of them. And there's many, many of them on the top here are the bees, uh, which I think when we think about pollinators, we always perhaps think of those first. On the left here is the honeybee. Interesting thing about a honeybee is not native. So that is not a native insect. That's where we get all of our honey. Um, that's what beekeepers maintain if they're beekeep, you know, if they're beekeeping. Um, but they are not native. Most of them are from Europe. Uh, so while we love them and appreciate them and eat all the honey that we can get, a lot of our emphasis is particularly for the, the Habitat Advisory Committee is for the native pollinators. And this includes like the next three, your bumblebees, your mason bees, your carpenter bees, and even those small sweat bees, things along those lines. I think in Pennsylvania, there's over 400 species of, of, of bees um, that are native. So, you know, we try to put a partic particular emphasis on those. And then on the bottom here on the left, we have things like butterflies. This is a black swallowtail. This is my favorite uh, butterfly. And I try to plant and plants that it likes uh, so that they'll come visit me at my house. Um, there's also moths. Moths do a ton of pollinators. They're sometimes not the most beautiful things to look at, but they work, you know, during the day. And many of them work at night pollinating, um, pollinating flowers that way. Things like hummingbirds and bats, those are all pollinators. Beetles, ants, flies, you know, there's a lot of things. Pretty much anything that's moving pollen from one flower to another or from one part of the flower to another is considered a pollinator. And we need them for a variety of different reasons. You know, people always say about, you know, for every three bites that you take, you know, all of our fruits and vegetables and things like that, those things need pollination. So these are very important animals. Garden ethos. So I want you to think about if you were starting a garden, if you have a garden, if you're modifying your garden or doing things along those lines, you know, I want you to start thinking about things in these three categories. You know, before you buy the plant, or plant the plant, or maybe even rip out plants, you know, let's think about it in these three categories. You know, the first one is aesthetics. Number one, for a garden, we want these things to look wonderful, right? We want them to be beautiful. We want them, you know, the neighbors to be pleased. We want you to be very proud. You know, it's it's thinking about how will this look and how will this look in my environment? 
Is it pretty? Does it have nice flowers or maybe nice foliage? What does it look like when it's winter time? Um, what does it look like when it's first poking out through the through the dirt? You know, things along those lines. So that's usually when we talk about gardening is perhaps the first thing we think about. Boy, that's a really pretty plant. I want that, you know, underneath my picture window. Um, so we think about that. But we also want you to think about ecological. How does this plant work within the web of our native environment, okay? In this picture here, you have a blazing star. That's a monarch butterfly. You know, these blooms provide, you know, nectar for, you know, the food of, the, of this butterfly in particular. But then what else does it do? You know, does it do other things um, for other animals. The one thing we're going to talk a little bit about is that for many native perennials and even for native shrubs and trees is this idea of the host plants. You know, in addition to having these flowers, which are going to feed pollinators, many pollinators use the foliage, the leaves and everything else to lay their eggs on. That's the only thing their larva will eat. Um, so, you know, there's some benefits that way as well. I have found that, you know, obviously you could have a lot of plants, you can have a lot of flowers, you're going to get a lot of pollinators. But if you get these host plants in your garden, you're going to see some, for, you know, this could be the only place where this uh, blazing star is, but pollen, you know, pollinators that use it as a host plant will come from miles around um, to lay eggs on it. And it's a really incredible thing. So think about the eco ecological aspects as well. And then finally, the environmental. How do these plants help us in our built environment? When we talk about rain gardens, we're talking about plants that, you know, are able to sit in standing water for a small amount of time. They have deep roots, you know, so that helps keep the water again on the patch of land where it fell or near where it fell. Um, you know, there's the other benefits. Of course, you talk about trees and shade and how that, you know, how that uh, shades and cools down, you know, concrete in our homes and means that we don't have to run the air conditioner as much, um, you know, things along those lines, in addition to just creating oxygen, right? And, you know, picking up particulate matter. So, you know, think about these three things anytime you're going to uh, make a change or create something in your garden. You know, the full disclaimer here is I'm going to talk a lot about what we did at our house. Um, and we have a lot of stuff going for us. Number one, I am a homeowner. Not everybody is. Number two, some of the things that were on the lot when we built that, when we, we didn't build, when we bought the house five years ago, you know, kind of worked in our favor. But then other things we had to make some, some decisions about for that. But if you're watching this and you say, you know, I, I don't think I can do this because I don't own a home or the home that I do live, you know, does not have this type of land area that I can do it in, or, you know, I'm not really all that interested, that's fine. But I'd like you to walk away and think about adding, you know, choosing one or more of these. The first one on the left is a rain barrel. This is what my wife calls shantying up the place. You know, this is a Delalo's olive barrel, 55 gallons. That thing's like 12 bucks. For under 30, you can set this up, put the spigots in, get a diverter, run it to your um, downspout, and you have a rain, you know, you have a rain barrel. You can daisy chain them together like I did here. There are other versions of rain barrels through Stormworks that are probably more, you know, easy on the eyes and look a little more modern you know, uh, and wouldn't cause, you know, people to roll their eyes and say, look at these crunchy people in their rain barrel. But, you know, you, you could do this. And the best thing about it is when it rains, these things fill up. And what we do is we use it to water all of our plants. And very rarely do we ever need to turn on the hose um, to water plants from there. So that does a good in trying to keep, again, the water that falls on your property. The second one is a, is a um, tree. You know, if you have a tree, um, or if you plant a tree, trees have a lot of benefits when it comes to stormwater management. Number one, they have those huge roots eventually when they grow, um, so they can take up a lot of water that falls. Another thing that they have going for them, and you know this if after it rains, if you walk under a tree, it's not raining outside, but you walk under the tree, it's still raining, but it's raining slowly. It slows down the amount of water that hits the ground, which then limits the amount of runoff. 
So instead of all of that rain just coming and hitting the sidewalk and hitting the road and flowing downstream, you know, it kind of slows down, giving our built environment a chance to deal with that. Okay, so planting a tree is always an excellent thing. And it doesn't have to be an oak tree. You know, I mean, oak trees could certainly do a lot and they're a wonderful species, you know, but if you're like, I don't have space, dude, you know, you could do a small tree. This tree in particular is a witch hazel. It'll get to about 20 feet. You could do a service berry, you know, that gets to about 15, 20 feet. Something along those lines um, might work better for you. And then the next thing is our wild and woolly uh, rain garden. So what is a rain garden? A rain garden is a simple man-made depression that captures and stores runoff from impervious surfaces. The impervious surfaces being, you know, stuff that it's not going to soak into. So that's your house, that's your garage, stuff like that. This is a garden that mimics waters, you know, nature's water infiltration system. So we want the water to collect there and we want the water to slowly seep down. And then, then this is also a pollinator habitat. It's not a pond or a water feature. You're not going to throw goldfish into this thing. Okay, the goal is, is to collect the water and have it slowly seep back into the earth. It's not a mosquito habitat. So we're looking for a spot that'll, you know, the water can infiltrate in less than 48 hours. 48 hours is the amount of time, you know, a uh, uh, mosquito larvae need and mosquito larvae need standing water. So, you know, we want to make sure that things are floating in by that point. You know, you build a rain garden. It's not just a summertime thing. It's not something you can shut off. So, I mean, this, we want a space that's going to work in the summer for the summer rains. It's going to work with snow melt. Um, it's going to do things along those lines. And if you do the work yourself, it's not overly expensive. Um, you could pay somebody to do all this, but you know, if you don't mind getting dirty and putting in some sweat equity, you know, you can you can get this in a reasonable amount of time. And if you have questions about that, we can talk about that. So this is from my town. I live in Dormont, which is outside of Pittsburgh, the gateway to the South Hills. Um, you know, and this is from their stormwater credit manual, you know, and it kind of details what their vision of a rain garden is, and then some of the requirements that have to be um, covered. So let's go through filling. We're all here. I see we have one question. Let me just check real quick. Love your rain barrel. Love that. I love ours too. We, I mean, we, we use it a lot. Uh, as far as rain gardens against it, you know, I don't know. I haven't really run into that. There are certain things, you know, you want to make sure, which we'll get into, you don't want to make sure that we're not, you know, water is not overflowing into your neighbor's yard. There can be, some, oh gosh, there, <laughs> there can be some, um, oh, that's like not going on. You know, if you have an HOA and things like that, there could be some uh some things you might have to do a little bit of extra things on but i'm glad people love their rain gardens okay let's talk about rain garden plant so if you're interested and if you're still with me and you haven't left yet you know let's think about some of these things about what you can do and start doing or look around your yard even this weekend to start planning for a rain garden first thing you should do is count the downspouts and where they go so walk around your home walk around your building and count all those downspouts where are they? How many are they there? And then look at the bottom and see where does it go? Does it go into a pipe that goes underground or is it more like an L, um, you know, there's like an L outlet and then it shoots out, you know, somewhere into your yard. If it goes into a pipe, you know, walk around the perimeter of your property and look around and say, okay, well, where, where does it go from there. So if it goes into a pipe, does it shoot down the alley? Does it go to the front street? You know, try to figure out those things. This is our house right here, um, you know, in lovely Dormont. We have four downspouts, one, two, three, four. And then, you know, all of these go underground into pipes and they collect with one pipe that then goes down our gravel parking pad. And then we'll dump water into the alley, which heads down to the VFW towards West Liberty Avenue. So that's kind of it. So in our count, that's what we've found out. So everything goes underground. There must be a pipe here, probably a pipe here, some here, somewhere here it meets and then goes down to here. So now you want to think about what's a suitable area for the garden. And then some of this has been spell, spelled out in 
the stormwater credit manual too. Um, but these are good practices. Number one, you want to stay 10 feet away from structures. So you don't want to build your rain garden, you know, right up against your house, right up against your basement, because that's going to be a lot of water sitting there and you want to keep that away from your foundation. You also don't, you know, want to build this up against your, your neighbor's house or their, their property. They're so 10 feet away from structures. It works best if the area slopes away from your house. So, you know, if there's a gentle slope away from your house down into your yard or down to the front yard or whatever, that works best. Um, or you're gonna be fighting gravity. If you're in some of the homes in what Southwestern Pennsylvania are like this, you know, there's this hill that kind of comes down into your backyard and then it flattens out and then your house is here. Having a rain garden there is probably not going to help your your house drainage, but it could actually catch some of the runoff coming down the hill, but that's you know probably another, that's a discussion for another day. You wanna stay away from areas that are directly under trees. So this is a depression. So we have to do some digging. Um, you don't wanna dig under an established tree, okay? You could injure the tree, you could kill the tree by doing that. So you might wanna pick a different spot. You want to make sure that you're not going directly over utilities. This is particularly important in the front yard of your house, possibly. Um, we're probably not going to be digging deep enough to hit a gas line, to hit, you know, uh, uh, electric lines or water lines or anything else like that. But, you know, if you had an issue with one of those, a contractor would need to come up, dig that all up and, you know, pretty much ruin all your hard work. And then if there's a spot in your yard that is always wet and marshy, you could think, well, maybe that would be a good place to put it, but you need a place where this is going to drain. So you need to find, a, so if there's like always a place that after it rains, it's always wet down there, even when it's dry, like it was earlier this month, it's still wet down there. That may not be the best place for it because we need a place that's going to drain it and get rid of it. And then another thing to think about too, is that you could do one big garden, which is what we did. Or you could do a few little gardens too. You could have a little rain garden coming off of each of your downspouts. You could have, you know, two downspouts that shoot into one rain garden. So it doesn't have to be this huge thing. You can also have smaller ones and you can have multiples of those. So, you know, in this case of our house, you know, we had the room. So we put in a larger one right here where the grass is. Um, and then, you know, the thought was, well, if we came up here and we made, you know, like a, a rain garden here, there's not enough space between our house and Chad and Michael's house, right? So, you know, we could do out the front, but then we'd have to like figure it out. So for us, because we had a big enough space, we'll talk about space here in a minute, we decided that if we could bust into this pipe, you know, and run a pipe this way, and we paid somebody to do that, I'll add, um, you know, we could collect all of the water from the house. Can it run near sidewalks or, or driveways? Will it damage concrete with freeze and thaws? I would keep it away. Does it need to be 10 feet away? No, but probably I wouldn't put it right next to it because you don't wanna, you know, again, there could be, there's the potential of having a lot of water sitting right next to it. So I would put it back at least a couple feet and not have it directly up against um you know your driveways or anything else like that okay uh we bought this house five years ago from big jim big jim was a lawn guy um so he didn't really do a lot of things with plants but he had this this is about a you know the lot was about a lot and a half so we were lucky to have it and everything else like that but ever since we bought it we've been taking away lawn space and putting in garden space. So I don't know what Big Jim thinks about that now, but that's what you know, we do. So you know, we had this whole space up here and we said, well, maybe we could put something right around in here and, and you know, figure that out. And it, it worked out that we were 10 feet from you know, uh, the property line and we were 10 feet. There wasn't any structures over here. And then there's a little retaining wall at the, at the end of the garden, but we were able to back off 10 feet from there to make it happen. Here's just an example of thinking about when you're looking even at your own home or if you're thinking about it from above, you know, here, small one here, it's taking all the water that's falling here and putting it there. And same goes here, there's a downspout here, you know, 
all the water that's falling on that blue spot is now coming and filling into this rain garden. And, you know, it's better than nothing. You know, would it be great if we could have it all from this house? Absolutely. But if you can only do a little bit, do it. All right. So now it's time to do some, you know, high school math. Go back to geo you know, geometry class here. So a couple calculations you have to do. You have to measure the footprint of all your structures of your in total impervious area. So that means thinking about what's the area of your house? What's the area of your garage? What's the area of sidewalks, you know, driveways, chicken coops, whatever. Anything that is not, you know, sucking down, you know, sucking in that grass or that, that, um, that rain as it falls, okay? And that's length times width, and that gets your area and that'll get it in square feet, okay? If you live in Allegheny County, you could go to the Allegheny, Allegheny County real estate um, website, put in your address and they'll do some of this work for you um, to figure that way. And then you wanna figure out what's the tonal drainage area to the garden. So then you're thinking, well, how much do you wanna take? You know, if you're just taking from your house, and not your garage, or you're just taking from your house, and not your driveway, you know, whatever you could, you let's, let's identify that. So for us, you know, our house footprint is 12, you know, 1240 square feet. Um, so we've decided that if we're going to try to do 100% drainage, you know, then let's plan for that. So you want to do that, check out if you don't live in Allegheny County, your county, like real estate tax, property, you know, website might be able to, to clue you in because this is some of the stuff that we get taxed on. Um, so then, you know, they would have a pretty accurate view of that. Then you want to determine slope. We said we want this kind of gradual slope that's going away from your house and towards your garden to help, you know, gravity to get that water flowing, you know, and then that's, you know, slope is rise over run times 100. So what you do is you take a stake, you take about, you know, 10, let's say 10 feet of string, and you take another stake, and you kind of set something up like here on the top. All right. At the downhill stake, you take a measurement of how much that is, you know, that's your rise over the run, which is 10 feet times 100. And then that'll give you your slope. You're looking between eight, or I'm sorry, 3% and 8% slope. If you have a 2% or a 1% where it's totally flat, you could probably still do it. If it's a steeper than 8, 12%, you know, things can get a little wild and you might, you know, I think the you might have to dig a little deeper. You might want to talk to somebody about that. Um, and it may not, it may not be worth it, or you'll have something that's a little too steep, you know, but you need just that gentle slope. Now, if you look at this. In the grand scheme of things, the before digging, there you go, and the after digging, if you're the one digging this, you'll see that most of the digging starts uphill. And then with each, you know, shovel full, you're kind of doing less and less digging, right? So if here you've said, I'm going to dig down six inches, you know, it's not going to be six inches. You're not going to be taking six inches of dirt every time. It's going to get gradually lower as you're moving towards the end of your garden. Okay. So there's a lot of digging at the end and then at the, you know, at the, at the beginning and then at the end, because you're building the berm, you know, there won't be as much digging, but you want that bottom when we talk about the actual dig, you know, we'll talk about that, but you want it to be as flat as possible. We need as much surface area um, for this water as we can get. And if it if it's, you know, six inches here and you keep going six, then you're going downhill, but we want this to be nice and flat on the bottom. Three Rivers Wet Weather has a good calculator to determine how deep you should go. Um, it has recommended and preferred. It seems to me now, you know, again, I'm not a climate scientist or anything else like that, but it seems to me that when it rains nowadays, you know, it rains a lot in a small amount of time, as opposed to these all day soakers that I seem to remember as a, as a kid. Um, so, you know, it's not uncommon to get an inch to two inches or more in a rain event. So, you know, this is a good one at Three Rivers Wet Weather. Um, that you can go use their calculator and then they can give you some, some idea about how deep you have to, to dig. Six inches, not too much. So then, you know, the back of the envelope calculation here is to think about what's the impervious area that you're draining. So in the case of us, we're saying, okay, 
our house is 1,240 square feet. 10% of that should be the size of your garden if you wanna do 100% drainage. So 1240, that's the area of our square footage of our house. We wanna pull all the water that falls on the top of our house, okay? That would be 100% drainage. So then we need 120 square feet of garden. Now, we don't have to take 100%, right? If we only, you know, if we cut into and, and moved just one downspout, and that's all we wanted to make for a rain garden, then we'd only need 30 square feet of, of garden space, right? Because that would be 25% drainage. So, you know, you got to think about it like that. Do you need to take it all? You don't necessarily have to take it all. If you don't have room, you could just take a little bit, but that's kind of how you figure that out. 10% of the impervious is generally the amount of rain garden that you need. And then if you're only taking, depending on the amount of, of, um, of downspouts or, or however you're going to get the water to your garden, you know, you can subdivide it further that way. I will, I see if people um, asking about the slides or notes for participants. I know that this will be on um, the pit sustainabilities uh, um, YouTube channel. And I think, yeah, we'll certainly have these things, you know, available if you want to go through the slides as well. All right, so we talk about 120. That's what we did, we decided to do because we want to do 100% drainage. So our garden at the end of the day, we said, let's do eight by 15. We had the space for that. We were 10 feet from everybody else. And then we decided to do 10 inches deep. Why did we do 10 inches deep? I really have no idea. I just decided, let's go big. <laughs> we built this thing. I built this thing probably in April, May of 2020. So I had a lot of extra time on my hands. Now, it's important to, you know, see if there's any money available, at least, you know, in its, in its completed form for you. Um, so, you know, if you check your tax bill or whatever you pay to the local government, and if you pay a stormwater fee, there is a chance that there could be some credits available for you. So if you're looking through that and you say, oh, yeah, we pay this, it's $100 a year, it's $50 a year, whatever, check your municipal web page, um, you know, search stormwater and see if anything comes up. Not everybody does, but there's a lot of towns, at least in Allegheny County um, and the surrounding areas that do. I grew up in Westmoreland County and a town that I would not call progressive by any, you know, any stretch of the imagination with one exception that they have uh, credits available if you build a rain garden. If there is, there should be some sort of credit manual that will detail what you have to do in order to get these credits. Um, you know, and it'll say, just like that slide a couple slides ago, you know, it needs to be this big. It needs to have these things. You need to send in this. You need to do that. You know, it's it's a lot of bureaucratic work that's going to need to do to get this type of credit. Um, but it's it's it is possible if that's what you want to do. In my case, we pay a little less than $100 a year in stormwater fees. Um, to build the rain garden, I can get 25% discount on that. So in essence, I get $25 back every year, assuming that I turn in the paperwork every year that says that I still have a rain garden, you know, yada, yada, yada. So check your local municipality. In Dormont, you know, it has both the stormwater uh, credit for rain barrels. That's a one-time thing. And then also, you know, this ongoing thing, if I can collect 25% of the impervious, you know, the, the water off of my property, then I get 25% off. If you live in the city of Pittsburgh or use PWSA for your water, they too also have a stormwater credit for rain gardens. It's three quarters of an inch of rain, it's 50%, you know, discount search WPSA stormwater rain garden, something like that, Google it. Um, and then you'll get to your credit manual and you can go through what it is that they need. We live next to Mount Lebanon. They have one for rain barrels. They don't have a rain garden one. Green Tree, Castle Shannon, those are two other, you know, communities around us. They don't have one, but we're lucky enough to have it. And dang it, we've done it. Okay, so we've done all the planning. You've done your math. You've put away your calculator. Now it's time to pick up a shovel and do the coffee can test. This is to test to see how to make sure that water will indeed 
you know, percolate through the ground um, where you want this garden. So what you're going to do, you know, you could do this tomorrow. Noon tomorrow, you go out, you dig a one foot hole about the size of a coffee can, one foot down, you fill that sucker up with water the whole way to the top and you walk away. You come back 24 hours later. So lunchtime on Sunday and you look in the hole. If there is still water in the hole, then you might need an, to think about a new place to have your garden or rain barrel or plant a tree there, okay? Because if it hasn't completely drained in 24 hours, then you're going to have some drainage problems with your rain garden, okay? That could be, like, we all have really clay soil, but, you know, it could be that there could be some bedrock. There could be, I mean, who knows, in this town, you know, there could be an old foundation from some old house underneath, you know, like two feet below that's stopping this, you know, things along those lines. The water table could be an issue, but if you come back and there's still water in it, you're going to have to think about a new place. Now you've come back and there's no water in it. Fill it up again. You get a roller and measure, you know, how much water is in there to the inch. So, you know, let's say it's 12 inches. Come back an hour later and see what's changed. You need at least a half inch per hour. If you can get, and certainly preferably more, but if you can do at least a half inch per hour, then a rain garden will probably work there. Okay. Because again, we want the water to come in, but we need the water to slowly work its way down um, into the ground below us. Uh, so that's the coffee can test. 24 hours, how much does a, you know, a, a foot of rain or a foot of water should be able to suck down in? And then after that, fill it up again. It's already saturated. You should be able to get half inch per hour from there. All right, you still with me? All right the dig. First thing you want to do as a safety concern, particularly if you're in your front, in the front lawn is where you're looking at this, or by the street. Um, you want to call 811, 811 at least in Pennsylvania, maybe everywhere, I don't know, but you, you're calling to make sure that you're not building on top of um, utilities, okay? And again, we're probably not digging deep enough to hit any of these things. But, you know, if a contractor, if you needed something done with it, they'd come and rip up your rain garden. It would be a sad day. So you want to make sure we're trying to stay away from that. This normally takes about two weeks. So it's not something to call the morning of. Okay. So you want to think about that two weeks and they'll come out and they'll, they'll mark it or take a look at it um, for you from there. The morning of, first thing you want to do is put a bunch of beer in the refrigerator, right? Because this is going to be a little bit of work, but here we go. You have two options of removing the turf. So if you think about it, this is down in your lawn. There's just, there's just grass there. Um, you know, here's your two options. Number one, a garden hose is good to outline. So you kind of know, like, these are the parameters. We said we did eight by 15, you know, make sure that you know exactly where you want, because you don't want to you know, you want to keep to those specifications. So a garden hose is great for that. You can remove the turf yourself. So you take a sharp spade or a mattock and you cut and you remove all the turf. Okay. It's, it's hard work. It could be worse because, you know, when we're talking about our lawns, the, the, um, you know, the roots are only like this deep, uh, but still it's, it's quite a bit of work. You can rent a machine that does that, you know, you can go to Lowe's and get one and they'll kind of scrape everything off um, to go from there. I would suggest you don't rototill uh, this thing. And the reason I say that is because of weed seeds. So, you know, over the years, all of our dirt has all these weed seeds in it. Okay. And then if you rototill, sometimes it'll bring up some old ones to the top. And now they're finally getting the moisture. They're finally getting the sunlight, and now you have weeds coming up. So the less we can do to disturb the, the, the dirt, the better, in my opinion. So that's the way to do it all in one day. If you have some time and you don't mind shantying up your backyard a little bit, you can solarize. And the first thing you're going to do is you're going to lower the mower to the lowest setting. 
and you're going to run it all over the rain garden area. Okay, so you drop that cutting deck as low as it'll go, and you run, and you you're completely going to stress out the grass that is there. Okay, so you know you shouldn't cut your grass that low. The grass that we have in our yards cannot handle that. So then it's going to be an issue for the um for it to try to. So already we're having a setback with the grass. Then you cover it with tarps, plastic, cardboard, whatever. You weigh it down, you know, and you keep it like that for a month. Now the grass is starved. You know, it's not getting any sunlight. It's not getting any moisture. And it's already stressed out. So this is how we're going to kill the grass, okay? You keep it covered for one month, and then you pull everything off for one to two weeks. This then gives the grass anything that's still alive, this thinking that it has a chance to survive. So then it puts any energy it has into trying to grow a little bit more. And then after a week, man, you cover that thing back up for another month and you kill it outright. You do this two or three months of on for a month and off for two weeks, it's going to kill the grass and any weeds that happen to be there. But it does take time. So, you know, that that's the downside. Um, of it, but it is, uh, I've done this many times. And if you have the patience and you don't mind that, you know, there's like <laughs> a tarp in your backyard, you know, it's a, it's a good way to go. This is not nearly enough solarization. Again, I did this early 2020 and, you know, I couldn't just run to the store to get it. We had this piece of plastic. We used this big Jim who we bought the house from, you know, in addition to being a lawn man, he had all this Belgian blocks. We were able to use Belgian blocks really no. Once it's time to start digging, you start with the areas closest to your downspout. And again, how deep are you digging? If you're dipping, digging six inches, you want to make sure that you're just digging six inches. All right. So you dig and you measure. You dig, you measure. You dig, you measure. Um, and then you want to make sure that you're keeping that consistent over the span of your entire garden. Okay, so again, on a slope, that's going to be smaller and smaller chunks of dirt that you're going to be gathering or you're going to be taking up. All the dirt that you remove, you add to the berm. So you take it, all that dirt, and you put it at the bottom of the garden, at the at the end, the, the perimeter that way, and you smush it down. Okay, and you really pack it in there. So again, depending on the slope, you won't need to dig as much or maybe at all at the bottom. And then the berm is your levee system. That's what's going to hold the water back on the other sides. Here's a picture. So I just dumped it into buckets and then started to create the berm from there. I tried to do, you know, from the slope, you know, take two stakes and a string, making sure that that string is level, you know, and that's how I did it. So again, it's not the end of the world if it's not completely level, you know, but you want it to be pretty much level because if it's like here, if it's level, but here it's a little bit higher, you know, all the water is going to sit here. It's not going to get up here. And we want water to be everywhere. So we want that, you know, we want to make sure that we have a flat bottom or as flat as you can get. <clears throat> Excuse me, water entry. So now you've done all your digging, right? Miller time. Think about how you're going to get the water to your rain garden. If you have those downspouts with the L and the water just kind of shoots out, you could technically kind of modify that somehow and aim it you know towards your towards your rain garden um in this case on the left you could build this lovely like dry creek bed you know to have it go down but you know grass does such a poor job of sucking in that water that really it's just going to run off it in towards your rain garden so that's one thing or you can modify it you can use a pipe you know and you could run it in that way you want to think about overflow plans. So Dormont requires that you have an overflow plan. On the left, you can geek out on all the engineering about, you know, having a kind of an overflow pipe that goes down and yada, yada, you know, and that's all great. For us, it just meant that we took the berm down a little bit on the one side, as you can see here. And then if we did completely overfill, then that water would leave the rain garden. It would be running away from my neighbor's house. It would go through our vegetable garden, over our gravel um, driveway, and then down the alley towards the VFW. So that was kind of our overflow plan, because you do want to see that, because it is a possibility. You know, you think about, I think it was 2018, it was like Hurricane Nate came through, and we got about, you know, 10, 12 inches of rain around here over a span of three days. Um, 
So you do want to be prepared that if it does happen to get more water than you can deal with, that you want that flowing in a direction you're comfortable with. We put down one inch of mulch or uh, one inch of compost um, just to kind of get things going. That's a nice, you know, add some nutrients to the to the to the dirt. So it's going to give our plants a good chance to kind of kind of get moving. And then we did two inches of mulch. Now, if you do mulch in a rain garden, you want to do the triple shred mulch. If you do a chip drop, if you get the cheap, you know, like wood chips or whatever, they float. So the problem is, is when there's a rain, the water comes up, but when it goes back down, your mulch is not where you put it. Triple shred mulch, which is that wet, like smelly stuff, you know, it tends to make this thick mat that also keeps the, the weeds down, but then it, it stays wherever you put it. So you're going to need mulch for at least the first year. That's all we did. We didn't put any mulch down the second year. We didn't need to. All right, planning and design. How are we doing? Oh, God. Okay, so let's talk about some of the plants. This is the fun part, right? You, you know, you literally <laughs> broke your back trying to dig this thing in. Now let's talk about what you're going to put into it. We really urge you to use native plants, native plants that have evolved here, native plants that have a relationship with you know, other plants, other animals, things along those lines. In particular, we're really pushing for native perennials. Those are the plants that come back year after year after year. They are non-fussy in a way that they understand our climate. They grow in our soils. They're not, you know, they're not too concerned about, you know, that 70 degree day in January and that 30 degree day in May, like they're just kind of used to it because they've been here longer than we have, okay? They do need care at the beginning, but you know, they're generally not fussy. You don't have to run out and like throw something over them if it's, you know, on a frost, on a frost advisory night. These are pollinator magnets, okay? Because native pollinators are looking for native plants. That's what they're used to. They're, you know, they're, they're, they have evolved together um, so they find them more palatable. Say about bird food, you know, vending machines. So, you know, Doug Tallamy says, he's a researcher from Delaware, you know, a chickadee, one chickadee during one season eats 14,000 uh, caterpillars, slugs, bugs. You know, when you think about mama bird and baby bird, you know, even a cardinal is feeding the baby birds like icky stuff, right? worms, grubs, slugs, stuff like that. We want to invite that stuff into our garden, okay? Because some of those things like caterpillars will hopefully grow up and become beautiful moths and beautiful butterflies and things like that, you know, but the birds are actively feeding on those too. So it's important to have a lot of plants because then hopefully that means you're going to have a lot more bugs and a lot more icky things that the birds are going to eat, but then some of them will survive and grow and then, you know, kind of keep keep the generations moving. And then for native perennials too, there's deep, deep roots. If you look at this, this might be hard to see, but on the right there, the native plants, look how far down some of those roots go. I mean, you have that common nine bark that's like 15 feet down versus the day lilies that are going down like two feet. I love day lilies. They're great and everything else like that. But when we're thinking about the rain garden in particular, you need these deep roots because these are the highways for all that water. OK, and these deep roots are also what keep these plants alive. So when we went through that dry spell at the beginning of the month, you know, the established plants are just kind of like whatever. Why? Because they have eight feet of roots underneath them. They can find, you know, so they're they're better established. They can find moisture and then they can survive those things as opposed to like, you know, my lawn, which is still dead. If you need to learn about native plants, you know, the Ladybird Johnson Wild, you know, flower.org is a great place. They have a great search option where you can, you know, say, I live in Pennsylvania. I'm looking for a plant that's blooms or blue and they bloom in May and it's two feet tall. And then they'll give you a list of everything from there. Penn State has a great list of rain garden plants and tells you where you should put them in the rain garden. So for instance, wherever the water is coming in is always going to be the wettest part. So here's some plants that really like that versus here's some plants that maybe don't always want to be wet, but would be fine or on the berm or stuff like that. The Audubon Society has a great list too. They also sell native plants um, during the summer, spring, summer, and fall. So you can go up to Fox Chapel 
and, and buy some and take them from there. It's good to kind of sort them out and think, how, where do I want them? How would they all work? If you search rain garden template, rain garden design, you'll get lots of these. If you're artistic, you can pull out the paints and make something like this and it will just be lovely. For the rest of us that have no artistic ability, you can use Excel like I did and you know just kind of set things up here. Dormont required that I submitted all the plants in my rain garden. So then this is what I did from there. Um, and then, you know, kind of numbered them and said, all right, well, if this thing is supposed to have a space of three feet, then, you know, I'll take three blocks and then kind of make a square from there. Your options for plants and how to grow them. Um, consider these things. So left to right, least expensive, most expensive. But let's talk about pros and cons. Seeds are the cheapest way to do it. However, if we're talking native perennials, they also are rather fussy and require certain steps. So oftentimes for native perennials, you're gonna need to plant them in the fall so that the seeds are outside all winter because they will not germinate unless they have that freeze thaw cycle that we get all, all winter from there, okay? So you gotta think about that. Plus if it's going from seed, it's probably gonna be at least three years until you're actually happy with it. Three years till you have a full size plant, with blooms and all that other jazz. When you look at this bag in particular, it says wildflowers, you know, just because it says wildflower does not mean it's a native plant. I'm looking at there, I see some poppies. I don't know what else, that cornflower, which is nice, but it's not, you know, it's, it's not native. So, you know, think about that. In addition to the fact that, you know, when I work with seeds and if you're just scattering them, when they're popping up, I don't know, are they a weed? Are they the flowers? You know, I don't know. So. Now you know. Bare roots is the next one. This is probably about two bucks per uh, per plant. You know, in essence, what happens is that these, you know, this is mostly an online thing, I think. They grow these plants, and then what they do is they they chop off all the all the uh, the growth at the top, they put them in the refrigeration um, where they're monitored for moisture. And in essence, the, the plant thinks it's winter time. You order it, they put a bunch in a box, they ship it to you. You put them in the ground and then it goes, oh, it must be spring, must be summer. Oh, it's time to grow. And then that's how you get your plants. The downside of this is that it arrives looking like this. I'm already suspicious. It looks like it's dead. If you're like me, you plant them, you forget where you put them, and then, you know, you're disappointed. But they're about two bucks each. We did buy some of these and a lot of them did work. Eventually, it just took a while, you know, till you remember where you put them. The next thing is probably my favorite are plugs. You get these in trays, so you could get a bunch of them at the same time. This is about a one-year plant. Um, I like them because they come looking like this. They have foliage. Where you put them, you know where they are. You could tell they're alive, um, stuff like that. When you plant them, you're not going to see much growth because most of that happens underneath. Most of that's happening as it's growing those long uh, roots that it needs to survive the winter. But the second year, you might have a couple blooms. Third year, you've got a full year, you know, you get a full grown plant. Last thing is like an actual plant. If you go to Lowe's, this is what you get. It comes in a gallon container, but these things are like 10 to 20 bucks, but they're already ready. They're, they're more expensive because someone has had to care for them for the last three years. But when you get them, they're normally full size. They have their blooms and things along those lines. You can get a lot of this stuff online. I've spent a ton of money at Prairie Moon. You know, they'll send you all these plugs like this. They'll send, oh, you want a pollinator garden? You know, here's 150 square feet. Boom, you can, you know, send us this and we'll put it in the mail for you. There's May Marts every spring, native plant sales, maybe something in your garden, your neighbor's garden. You can go to the garden center. The garden center is tricky for the natives because sometimes they're not identified. I feel like I'm running out of time and I am. Design, shortest near the house. I decided to do this, try to put the shortest plants near the house and then the shrubs as a backdrop. Here is kind of my crosswalk in addition to short, medium and tall, but also the seasons. For a pollinator garden, you need stuff blooming all year. That's aesthetically pleasing because you want to see these flowers. Like, oh, the, you know, the Jacob's Ladder is, is blooming right now. And then by the time that's done, the columbines are coming in. And then by the time that's done, you know, you've got these, you know, golden alexanders are popping. You kind of want that. And that's what the pollinators need to get the nectar. Um, so, you know, you want to think about that. You don't want everything to just show up all at once. You kind of want to try to get blooms from April to frost. 
other design ideas. Again, you can look online, all these pretty little drawings and stuff like that. You could have a pocket forest where you have trees and, and shrubs. You could do an edible rain garden with cranberries and hazelnuts and a pawpaw tree. You know, blackberries love that kind of that moist environment. You could do short formal, you know, the butterfly weed, like two feet tall, something along those lines. Those things are available to you. Here are some of the things that I have in my garden. I got a nine bark over here. And I'm also trying to make some emphasis on this is some of the the moss or the butterflies that use it as a host plant, okay? The moss, I don't really know too much about, I'll be honest with you. Um, but again, they do, they're great pollinators and they're also great bird food. Nine bark's great because it's purple. The foliage is purple. That's what I like about it. So it kind of sticks out. This is a red twig dogwood in the metal here. You know, this is what it looks like all winter. And I love that. Everything else is dead. And then this thing's all red. And then you'll see this is a blue, a corner blue um, butterfly too. Very endangered butterfly and obviously very gorgeous. Button bush, it's getting ready to pop next week, I would say. Um, smells like oranges. In the spring, we have Jacob's Ladder, which is a low grower in the columbine um, that that comes in. So again, this is very useful for the early pollinators as they get going. They need the nectar, they need pollen, they need things along those lines. They can come to these plants to get that. Once these are done, we get into swamp milkweed. Everybody, if you don't know any other butterflies, you probably know the monarch butterfly. Um, it will only lay its eggs on milkweed because its caterpillars can only eat milkweed. That's it. If it lands on anything else, you know, those caterpillars are going to starve. So if you like monarchs, plant some milkweed, man. Um, and then they, they'll come. It's just incredible. It's like they just smell it and then they come over. Next we have, that's a silvery checker spot with the oxide sunflower. This is a perennial sunflower. So again, it comes back year after year. It's not like the big sunflowers with the seeds. I mean, these have seeds too, but not like, oh, I got to plant them every year. This thing comes back year after year after year. This has started blooming just this week. So we had swamp milkweed started about two, three weeks ago. And then the oxide starting now. The Joe Pye weed's probably going to start in another three three weeks. Joe Pye weed goes like 17 feet tall. It's like ridiculous. It swings around. It's got these great magenta flowers. I love it. Does it fit in our garden? It absolutely doesn't, but I don't care. Brings me joy and the pollinators like it. Once we get into fall, about August, Maximilian sunflower comes up. Again, it, this is what it looks like. It is covered with blooms um, and it comes back year after year after year. New England aster comes back to uh, you know, and it's covered with these flowers. And then on the smaller end, we've got the great blue lobelia um, that makes itself known, usually about September. These things all go to probably October uh, or whenever the, the frost is. And then that kind of knocks everything back. Plant your berm. You want to make sure that you plant your berm. Some people put just like the, the um, uh, you know, they'll take their scraped off grass and they'll put it over there. You know, plant it. I want those big, you know, you want those big roots on there. Where to plant? You can always plant in the fall. We learn from a small age, oh, I can only plant stuff in the spring and that's incorrect. You can plant in the fall. These, these plants need warm dirt, okay? So if you plant something in August or September, it'll continue to grow underground until Thanksgiving, okay? Because all that heat stays in the ground and that's only gonna help, um, only gonna help your, uh, only gonna help your roots. Plant densely, all right? Uh, my town has another rain garden, like a community rain garden, and there's only a couple of plants, lots of plants, lots of plants. And then plant multiples of the same plants. So don't just get one milkweed, get two milkweeds, okay? The more that you have, that's easier for the pollinators to find, um, and they like it where there's clumps. There are some pollinators that, you know, like honeybees, for one thing, they, on one trip, they're only going to one type of flower. Okay, and then they're going back. So they want to go places where there's a lot together. White or near, we said, do the berm. Maintenance, you're going to mulch and water the first year. All this stuff, even though they're natives, they still need some care, you know, that first year. You're going to have to maybe weed the first and second years. If you can go out safely during a rainstorm and see what's happening in your rain garden, you should. Just to see it fill up, it's ridiculous. And then you'll see it starting to calm down but it's worth doing it. And particularly after a large storm, go see, is your berm okay? Did it, you know, you know is, it, is it all good? Keep an eye on it. In the fall, don't cut everything down. I grew up thinking that, you know, 
sometime at the end of October, you're gonna cut everything down and get rid of it. Don't do that. Number one, it looks awesome like this picture here with the black eyed Susan, but birds will eat those seeds. Those seeds are up, the birds will eat them. And the ones they don't eat, they drop into your ground and you get free plants, you know, thin if needed. And then also if you have the credit, if they say, hey, you have to do this every year, you have to submit by this time, you have to, you know, somehow remember to do that. Whew. There's some resources here. Uh, let me check the questions. Okay. I know we're like, <laughs> I've got like one minute. I don't know if there's any questions. I'm happy to put my, um, where's the chat here? You know, here's my email on here. I will put in, if you have any other questions or anything else, I'm happy to stick around if you have a few questions um, for me, but if nothing else, Thank you very much for showing up today. Uh, good luck in your gardens and we'll just go from there. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Hi, thanks so much. I was just wondering, um, about the the credits you said that was in Allegheny County I I live in Westmoreland County so I was just trying to find credits so I would be very surprised if my municipal if if my local gives us credit or not um I would say that you know you have I grew up in Lake Trobe so and they uh, have, okay they have a they have a a, a a stormwater credit and you can get a crane you know you could get one from um for, for a rain garden. So, you know, you might want to check if you pay the stormwater mm -hmm. fee somewhere, it's worth checking. Or you could check, you know, by calling the borough building or, or township or whatever, and they might be able to point you in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in New Kensington, so I don't know. But we do have, we have three rain barrels and we used um, garbage cans, repurposed garbage cans for it. And we have big, um, you know, those big uh, plastic tubs after the first rain, my husband takes three of those and fills those with rainwater. And we nearly had to go to those in this most current drought. Yeah. But um, but yeah, so I, I'm very curious about that. So thank you so much for, for the information. I'm really gonna, I took lots of notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good, reach back out, let me know. But yeah, check with them because who knows, they might be able to like in our town and a couple other towns, if you have a rain barrel, um, you know, they'll give you a one-time like, mm -hmm you know, little break on that stuff. So that's worth looking at too. Do you keep your rain barrels up all year? I don't. So we use a diverter. Mm -hmm. We use a Fisker's diverter. And then usually around, you know, Halloween, we shut it mm -hmm. down for the year. Yeah, he. we do the same thing. We take ours down in the winter because they're not real rain barrels. So we don't know if they'll, you know, we drain them and that sort of thing. So I was just wondering. Yeah, okay, no, we great. used to own a house. We used to own a house, and and when we sold it, we included the rain barrels, and they keep theirs up all year. Now I don't know <laughs> what it, they're still there. They haven't exploded or anything else like that. Um, <laughs> but you know, I guess you could you could do that. I just worry about it freezing solid or you know whatever. Yeah, that's what we're worried about too. All right. Well, thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Have a good rest of your day. You too. Bye.